It is uh, such a pleasure to be here. I feel like as I'm speaking here towards the end of the program, um, I just must, must mention what a fantastic experience it's been um, to be here. Uh, I am not a social scientist by trade, and I don't think about the humanities as much as I arguably should in my day-to-day -day work. Um, but I must say that my interest and my curiosity have been piqued by the sessions that I've sat in on um, in ways that I wasn't uh, anticipating. Um, and I've definitely added a lot to my reading list for when I get back home. Um, so thank you so much to Vicki for the lovely introduction, to Susie and the entire Georgetown organizing crew who have been in contact with me tirelessly over the past several months and managed to coordinate over Zoom with me across 12 different time zones and ultimately get me here across those same 12 time zones. Um, so uh, very grateful to that tireless effort. And again, thank you to Michelle of Museums uh, for allowing us to use these incredible venues for this uh, conference. It has been um, an exceptional privilege to be able to uh, engage with so many great people in such a great space. So as was mentioned, I'm here today to introduce you to a string quartet piece that's going to be performed shortly titled Planetary Bands Warming World. Um, I was encouraged to undertake this work uh, when I was conducting research at University of Minnesota with a colleague, Scott St. George. Um, in my day-to-day -day work, I'm at the Environment and Natural Resources Institute at the University of Alaska Anchorage, where we have had snow on the ground since mid-November, and I've been commuting to work by cross-country ski. And I imagine um, I will have a lot more to shovel when we get back home. Uh, now, I am here today in large part, as a number of you are, because we know that the planet is warming. This is evident by the um, global time series that we see of temperatures projected on the screen right here, going back to 1880 when these good records began. And this is not something that we just see in the data. This is something that we feel in our day-to-day -day lives. As we experience it, we feel warmer, unbearably warm summers. And especially where um, I am in such a cold climate, I'm noticing that our winters are not as cold as they once were. And our, we're experiencing reduced snowpack in Alaska and in much of the northern latitudes. And we're lacking some of the deep freeze cycles that have been customary to that environment. And it's led us to experience and encounter news headlines about climate change on a far more regular basis than we would like to. Um, NASA, uh, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in the US, their Goddard Institute of Space Studies, curates the climate data um, that inspire this piece. So when every year of climate data is uh, published, they have a press release. So for January of 2021, we learned that 2020 was tied for the warmest year on record, shortly followed by learning that 2022 was tied for the fifth warmest year on record. But we can drill down even further to look at individual months, as they um, so kindly tell us. Uh, that June 2023 was the hottest June on record, immediately followed by the absolutely hottest month on record, July 2023, since the record keeping began in 1880. And these all come together, sadly, into a series of year after year warm uh, climates that manifest themselves in natural disasters such as floods and devastating wildfires um, that take uh, far more lives than they should and um, also do a huge amounts of economic damage and property damage to the people who experience them. And with our current rate of emissions and the way that uh, climate is changing, we can sadly only expect these trends to continue. But there's a nuance to the story of climate change that is often overlooked, which is that uh, the entire planet doesn't experience climate change equally, strictly from a temperature standpoint. And we are able to show that the far most extreme latitudes of the planet, being the, the far northern latitudes and the far southern latitudes, are actually warming at a far outpaced rate relative to um, their more tropical counterparts. So this is to say there's a geographical story to tell in the climate change data that we report on. And this story ultimately is buried in endless amounts of climate data points um, that are gathered from on the ground temperature measurements as well as from climate modeling results and even um, satellite measurements of Earth's atmosphere. 
And when all of these data are taken collectively together, they are what tell us the story of our warming climate. And myself as a climate scientist and my colleagues uh, face the task of communicating these data to the public and to stakeholders and policymakers as effectively as we can, um, which is always a big challenge in our work because we rely on a limited toolbox to communicate these data. Um, we often rely on visual aids like graphs that you've already seen of the temperature series. We'll show maps where the climate has been warming outpaced to other areas. And sometimes we'll even just show you raw numbers like on the previous slide. And of course, it, uh, it's, it's saddening when the work that you do to generate these data and to communicate them um, seems to fall on deaf ears, so to speak. Uh, we see that stakeholders and policymakers are not making the advances required to address climate change as quickly as possible. Um, as Mazen aptly noted in the prior panel, they say blah, blah, blah. So when I was at Minnesota, my colleagues and I tried to broaden the senses with which we communicate climate data. We asked ourselves, what if we could use sound uh, or more specifically, what if we could harness the power of music to make these global temperature series known? So to attempt to do this, we harnessed the medium of a string quartet. Uh, NASA also conveniently puts out, or puts out temperature time series from discrete regions of the globe that are separated by latitude, separated into what I would call planetary bands. And in this respect, we attempted to have each instrument of the string quartet perform the temperature time series of each of these regions. So we did this by actually taking the raw temperature measurements of each of these regions and directly translating them to the pitch of each instrument. So as you hear the piece tonight, um, which progresses through time, uh, you will hear the pitches gradually rise on each instrument. And you may notice that the first violin, which is performing the Arctic time series, um, is rising exceptionally quickly. So our two violin players will each be performing uh, the Arctic band, followed by the band directly under it of those other northern latitudes. And then the viola and the cello will respectively perform the temperature time series of the subtropics and of the equatorial region. Now, accompanying this piece um, will be a map such as this, one for each year, which will be one for each note um, of the piece that you're about to hear. And each map is color-coded for each region, where the bluer temperatures are going to correspond to cooler temperatures. And the red, warmer colors are going to mean warmer temperatures in that region. So here for 1880, where the piece begins, we can tell that across the globe, um, we were experiencing a relatively cool condition. Of course, prior to um, the post-industrial uh, greenhouse gas emission that has resulted in a lot of our current climate change. Now, for example, in 1981, um, we can see we have things a little bit different here. And I should mention that the data that are actually fueling this piece are what are called um, temperature anomalies. So that means that the Arctic in 1981 was not actually warmer um, than the equator. It was, in fact, colder. But it was experiencing a much warmer condition relative to what it usually experiences um, than the equatorial region, which was more or less on pace or a little bit cooler even. So keep that in mind as we go throughout this piece um, and the colors that you're about to see. Now, without further ado, we'd love to get to the music. So I'm pleased to welcome to the stage from the Qatar Philharmonic Orchestra, Lorena, Dimitri, Andrea, and Christoph.
Thank you so much. What a wonderful performance. Um, you may notice that the piece, in fact, ended um, in the year 2016. I believe it actually ended in 2015. Um, and of course, that's not the year we're in right now. Uh, the fact is, when I attempted to go back and update this score after I had written it, after the 2015 data came out, um, it turns out that the very next year was, in fact, um, effectively out of the range of the first violin, uh, meaning that the Arctic had warmed so severely in just that one year since I had um, finished the first version of the piece that um, it would have required an entire reworking, um, which I think speaks volumes for itself. Um, so again, I am uh, deeply indebted to the musicians for being able to perform this piece. Thank you so much. Um, there are going to be two other pieces to be performed on this program. Um, but first of all, I have to cycle through the rest of these severely red years. Um, and again, I need to uh, acknowledge the support that I initially got at University of Minnesota from my colleagues uh, who were instrumental in putting this work together. Um, so a wholehearted thank you to them. And then I'm uh, going to introduce the two other pieces that you're going to be hearing this evening. Uh, the next piece is titled Guten Nacht from Winter Eyes, um, written by Franz Schubert. And this was written during the year without a summer, um, which was 1816. Um, this year without a summer followed a volcanic eruption um, in the year 1815 in Indonesia, uh, filling the atmosphere with ash and blocking out the sun over much of the world. And I would be remiss here if I didn't mention that you can in fact see this in the tree ring record, um, which I spend most of my days looking at. Um, and as a result of this uh, summerless year, much of the art emerging from this period was very, very morose. Um, following this piece will be the storm um, from the autumn portion of Vivaldi's Four Seasons. Uh, thanks again to these four fantastic musicians. Thanks again to all of you for being here, and please enjoy the rest of the program.
хорошо. Susie, how am I supposed to follow that? Another round of applause for the QPO and Daniel Crawford. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Fahad al Turki. I'm the Exhibitions and Public Programs Manager here at um, Sherab Museums. Um, I've been working here since 2011 and collaborated on many educational and institutions uh, in Qatar and beyond on exhibitions, programs, and talks. Unfortunately, never with my own alma mater, Georgetown University. 
um, until now, and it was definitely worth the wait. It has been an incredible, yes. It has been an incredible journey that started in April, earlier this year, um, with a very cryptic email from Susie. Um, and I quote, I'm writing to introduce you to three professors who are working on a fabulous new research initiative on energy humanities, end quote. That was an underestimate, underestimate Susie. <laughs> My deepest gratitude to the lead faculty and curatorial team, professors Firat Uruk, Trish Kale, uh, Anto Mohsen, uh, Vicky Gugazian, for their insightful approach to utilizing our museum spaces to their fullest potential. This, of course, cannot be done without the incredible support and management by the Sears team, Zahra Barber, Susie Mergani, Elizabeth Wanucha, and the rest of Sears. Your creativity and commitment has been inspiring. A special men a mention to the conference and events team at GUQ, particularly Maha Aredi for the impeccable organization and support. Our panelists hailing from diverse corners of the world are the essence of this event. Your contributions have been invaluable and we eagerly anticipate future collaborations. Um, a unique aspect of uh, Hewarat, uh, this installment, is the fusion of art and academia, realized through collaborations with exceptional artists. We are pleased to announce that some of these artworks will, be, will remain past the forum until 27th of January, and they are GUQ's artist in residence, Victor Achmanors, for those who slept in the dark with identifiable ghosts. Marissa Benedict and David Reuters, I Can Only See Shadows and Dark Fiber. Daniel Khouri and Ziad Abu Rish is the search for power. And Hamad Bukhamsin and Ali Karimi's civil work aid project for the Gulf. My team at Mishir Museums, particularly Ghada Yusuf, Muhammad Al Yusuf, Muhammad Dalul, Rashid, and Amr, deserve special thanks. I must also acknowledge Abdullah Nama, the general manager of Mishir Museums, whose vision and leadership have been crucial to this collaboration's success. <laughs> Lastly, uh, our, fa our facilities management and security teams have been the unsung heroes, ensuring our spaces remain pristine and safe throughout this event. Now it's my honor to introduce the final speaker for the evening of the forum. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Vicky Gukazian to the stage. Thank you, Fahad, and, and thank you for, for giving us the, the rundown of everyone who deserves uh, just so much thanks for this incredible event. Um, I'm going to keep this very, very brief uh, since it's been a really action-packed two days, and I know everyone has conversations to continue and, and reception to attend and, and dinner to eat, um, and also because I feel quite inadequate to the task of, of giving you uh, a final word here after um, all of the, the wonderful events and, and panels um, that we've all attended. So please don't think of this as the final word, just some, some very brief thoughts uh, uh, and takeaways to sum things up. Um, I, I will say just one more thanks again, um, it can't be said enough, um, to everyone involved in, in organizing um, the forum. Um, I've been away from, from Doha for the past six months, and so this was a really, really lovely way to come back. Um, to the city and, and to, to Georgetown. Um, and I did also want to want to make a special point of, of extending um, GUQ's thanks to Meshera Museums. Um, I've had the opportunity to come and visit the museums a number of times over the past uh, few years of living in Doha, but this was really a special way to see them in, in a very new, uh, new light. Um, and then finally, uh, thanks as well to all of our participants, to all the speakers, artists, performers, and attendees of the forum whose contributions really, really made this a special event. Um, so just some, some really, just maybe three really brief uh, takeaways from me uh, to wrap things up before the reception. Um, first of all, uh, I, I, as a number of, of, of other people I think also experienced, I spent um, two days at, at COP28 before coming back here, um, and I was very frequently frustrated during those two days by this kind of relentless sort of surface level focus on um, technologies um, and financial solutions um, to, the, to the really sort of um, serious and, and um, enduring challenges um, 
that we face today. Uh, so it was a relief um, to come back uh, to this conference and then from the very first panel um, to uh, experience this much needed complication of, of that attitude that I think has been one of the real through lines for the past two days. Um, and that is this push for us all to attend to the ways that our cultural practices and our desires and beliefs and even our aesthetic paradigms are shaping our commitments to energy systems and our aspirations for, for change. I, I think this forum has been a reminder of how much we need those kinds of, of insights from all of you. Um, secondly, uh, I've, I've been inspired uh, by how energetically um, you all have modered, mo modeled interdisciplinary fluidity. Um, and even maybe to go beyond that, I think many people here have modeled ways of, of thinking of their disciplines and training differently. Um, uh, and, and not just because we designed the, the forum to be multi, a multidisciplinary endeavor, but because that was already very integral to the work of, of many of, of the attendees here. Uh, I think over the past two days we've seen, uh, for example, that, that arts practice can engage for ex in, in archival investigations and it can engage in practices of critical description and critique. Um, and we've also seen that the everyday practices of our energy use um, can be conceived as, as sites of creative experimentation, albeit creative experimentation that's always being uh, made precarious um, by the systems of empire. Um, there's been many other examples of that, of that kind of disciplinary fluidity that I would invite everyone to, to take the time and space to reflect on. And lastly, uh, and this is maybe just a, a carryover from the conversation that, that we were all having, uh, many of us were having at, at, the, at the lunch earlier today, uh, we really did intend from the inception um, of, the, uh, of the idea for this forum for it to be a network working event, a uh, network building event for, for everyone who's in attendance here today. When we framed our uh, Energy Humanities Initiative at Georgetown uh, three years ago, we did so with the desire to reorient our contribution to the field um, around this region and around the, the global south. Um, but that's something that we realize we can only do in humble collaboration um, with all of you who we've been so pleased to host here at the forum. Um, so once again, um, thank you for your immense contributions uh, to the event. Please uh, keep in touch um, and, and maybe to, to sort of borrow a, a line from Omar al Khad earlier today, let's please think of this uh, as, a, as a prologue um, rather than an epilogue. Thank you. And uh, uh, just a, a couple quick announcements. There is a reception um, that, that I hope you all will, will enjoy here in the courtyard. Um, and then we, we do have a number of people registered for the working dinners um, later this evening. So there's three of those working dinners. Um, and I think maybe if just a, a, a few minutes uh, before 6 p.m., um, if you can find uh, the group that you were assigned or that you signed up to go to the working dinner with. So I, I believe um, if you signed up for the energy from the Global South dinner, you should look for me and Anto. Um, if you signed up for uh, energy from below, uh, you should look for Trish. Um, and if you signed up for energy aesthetics, you should look for Ferrat. And then we'll, we'll, we'll walk uh, to dinner in Misharib uh, together. So maybe just one more round of applause for everyone who, who was involved in, in the event. Thank you all so much for coming.